All right, Genesis chapter number 4. Um, I kind of went over this, this first verse last week, and Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, which completely destroys that, that, that false doctrine of the serpent seed of, of Cain being of the devil, which we know he's of the devil, but spiritually, not physically, because physically, verse 1 here states that Cain was the direct physical result of Adam knowing his wife Eve about them having their relationship together. So let's keep reading here. Verse number two, it says, And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So they have these two sons, Cain and Abel, real familiar story. And it tells us Abel was a keeper, a keeper of sheep. He was a shepherd, right? Abel had sheep and he watched over his sheep. But, but uh, Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer, right? He planted and he grew. And they, th those were their two occupations. They were doing... Um, their own thing, and, and each one, completely fine. No problems, nothing sinful, just that's what they did. And it's telling us here. Verse number three says, and in, the process, and in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of, the, of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So here we see Cain and Abel, they both bring an offering unto God. And as I said, Cain, he was a farmer, so his offering that he brought was, you know, the fruit of the ground. He brought, he brought God, before God, he brought him some fruit or from some vegetables or what, you know, whatever he was growing, he brought some of his crops as his offering to bring unto God. And Cain, I mean, excuse me, and Abel, he brought the first of the firstlings of his flock. You know, the firstling, the fir you know, the firstborn, one of the firstborns of his flock, he brought to the Lord. And it says here that, that God had respect unto Abel, which means he accepted his offering. It was, it was valid. It was something that God would recognize as an offering unto him. But Cain's offering, he did not respect it. He did not accept it, what Cain did. Now, First of all, I want to point out here that their two offerings are very symbolic, okay? And there's, a, there's you know, God accepting one. Is it because that the, that the fruit of the ground was just wicked and sinful? No. Um, but these offerings, and as you'll see all throughout the Old Testament especially, the offerings that were given unto God, almost every single one of them represents salvation in one way or another. You have the sin offering, the trespass offering, you know, all these offerings through the Mosaic Law that were given unto God all required the shedding of blood and um, were a picture of Jesus Christ to come. And this is really important because we don't want to have a false concept of our salvation and throughout any time. You know, people who believe in this dispensational doctrine believe in, oh, you know, there's all these different seven or nine or 20 or 100 or however many dispensations they believe in. Um, they'll say that, oh, well, see, things were different in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. And then there's this other dispensation, this other period of time from sin until what, you know, Moses and, you know, all these different things. They have all these different rules and stuff. Now, were things a little bit different in the Garden of Eden? Sure they were. Before sin entered into the world, sure, because the curses hadn't come. And, but does that mean that salvation was different or anything doctrinally was really any different? No. No, no doctrines are any different. Just because the way that they lived might have been a little bit different, that, that is meaningless, which is why we're not dispensational, even, even mildly dispensational, because it's stupidity. It came, from, it came from a man that wasn't even saved. That whole doctrine was founded by... By a, uh, created by a man that, that was a false teacher and a false prophet. But um, what we see here with, with Cain's offering, that, that offering of the ground, of the land, of tilling the ground and, and, and the fruit of the ground, was more of a, um, it's a symbolic of, of working, of man's work of bringing the best that you can bring and working with your hands to bring that offering unto God. Um, whereas the other one, Abel's sacrifice, was an animal sacrifice, which would be the, you know, the shed blood that would cover us and, and cover us from our iniquities and pay for our sins. It's, it's that symbolism there is, is very important and ought not to be overlooked, which is, again, a key reason why, why God did not accept Cain's offering. Now, I think, I believe this, and, I, and I can't, I'm not dogmatic about it because I can't completely prove it from Scripture. Um, 
we don't know everything that Adam and Eve knew that God had told them and that Cain and Abel and, and everybody else at that time knew. Now, they did not have the entire word of God revealed unto them. We know that much. But how much of God's word did they have revealed unto them? We don't know. I mean, the book of Genesis was penned down by Moses, yet these things really happened. So just because they weren't written down in a book until Moses doesn't mean, you know, obviously all of these things happened. I think they already knew what God wanted for an offering or for a sacrifice. And we see um, in Hebrews 11.4, you don't have to turn your stay in Genesis, Hebrews 11.4 says, By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. This, this occurrence that we read, this, this story in Genesis chapter 4 about Cain and Abel, is actually a very important story in the Bible because Cain is referred to multiple times, about three times in the New Testament. And here we see Abel is in, this, is in that great... Um, chapter on faith in, in Hebrews, Hebrews 11. And it's, it's explaining right here that Abel offered the sacrifice by faith. Faith is believing and believing in that which is not seen. In order for Abel to have faith, he had to know what he had faith in. So this, is, this would be the reasoning why I believe that they knew the offering or the you know, that God wanted. It was... It was something that they, they already knew. Now, Cain or Abel happened to be a shepherd. He happened to have sheep. So bringing that firstling might have been easier for him. I don't know, because he already had his sheep. Whereas Cain just, you know, he, didn't ha he probably didn't have any sheep. I don't know. That's not what he did. Um, he would have had to bring, you know, get a sheep and bring it to God. But, um, you know, at this point, you could, you, you could probably figure that Cain had good intentions. Now, he obviously disobeyed or you know he didn't bring the right sacrifice for his offering. He didn't he didn't bring what God wanted and he, and it wasn't accepted of him. And um, I preach an entire sermon about this, but it's important to point out because it's it's so prevalent in today's Christianity that people have a tendency to think that well, my intentions are good so that everything's basically okay. You know, God looks at my heart and yeah, I might be sinning, but hey, at least God knows I'm trying and he sees my heart. Now, there's always a little bit of truth to that story. Obviously, God does look at our hearts, and our hearts are very important, but that doesn't excuse or negate any sin that we commit. We still ought to be doing things the right way. Now, Cain, you could say, you could argue Cain had good intentions. He was bringing an offering. I mean, what could be wrong with bringing an offering unto God? Well, what could be wrong with it is that that's not what God said he wanted. You're bringing something else. You're doing something that God didn't tell you to do. And um, it wasn't accepted. God didn't, ac he's not going to accept man's works. He's not going to accept our own righteousness. He doesn't accept those things. He accepts what he says he wants. And it's that simple. And, and it really is very simple. If he says he wants a blood sacrifice, if he says he wants an animal as an offering, then that's what you do. That's what he wants. We, you know, if we want to please God, we're going to do what he wants us to do. We're not just going to go off and do something else. Um, or we shouldn't. But, you know, Cain maybe did have his heart in the right place. But he didn't do well according to God, which is why his offering wasn't accepted. And we can see that. Look at verse number... Um, Number six, it says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Wroth meaning like wrathful or angry. And why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So here we see, he says, If you do well, hey, you'll be accepted. And if you don't, then sin lies at the door. His offering wasn't accepted. He didn't do well. He wasn't doing well in bringing that offering unto God. Now, the big problem that Cain had, it wasn't his offering, okay? Did he offer what God wanted? No. But do we see God dealing with him like, like God's real angry and he curses him just because he brought the wrong offering? No. God just explains to him and says, okay, look, Cain, you know what? 
if you do well, you'll be accepted too. You know, I accepted Abel's sacrifice. If you, if you do well, if you bring the right thing, you can be accepted just the same. But, so Cain's problem wasn't his offering, it was his reaction. How did Cain respond to that rebuke? Well, he got angry. That's why God said, you know, why, why, are, um, why art thou wroth? Meaning angry. So Cain got angry because he got rebuked by God. And then he says, and why is thy countenance fall? Your countenance is your face. So he's saying, you know, why do you have, why do you have such a bad look on your face? Why, why are you angry? Why are you so upset, Cain? All you have to do is just do what's right and then everything's fine. And um, this is what happens many times with people when they hear their sins get reproved from God's Word. Um, I, I've seen it over and over and over again. Um, people, they come to church. You could look at them say their heart's in the right place. Maybe they want to do certain things. But then they hear from the, from the Bible, they hear from God's Word, their specific sin, something that they're doing, is, is brought up and, and preached against. And, and you hear the Word of the Lord saying, you know, God hath said, thus saith the Lord, you know, you're not supposed to be doing this sin, what, you know, whatever it may be. And people all of a sudden get angry. And their face starts to change. And, and they don't like to hear the fact that what they've done isn't acceptable unto God. And... It's sinful. It's pride. We, we need to be able to just say, well, if this is what God wants, and then that's what I'm going to do for Him. And if I did what's wrong, I'm going to change. I'm going to do something different. They end up, and oftentimes these people get, end up getting mad at the person that tells them. That's why people will, will quit church, or they get angry at the pastor because he's preaching the Bible. He's preaching on their sin. But all of a sudden, they feel like they've been personally attacked, and they feel like, you know, oh man, why did you have to bring that up? And, or, you know, whatever. They have all these bad attitudes. It's a foolish response to get angry at the person that tells you that what you've, did, what you've done is wrong. Um, over and over again, I, I've said this, I'll say it again. You know, the person that loves you is going to be the one that tells you if you're, you know, if you're in some kind of a sin, it's just to point it out in love to show you from, hey, look, you know, Look at what the Bible says here. Because we know that if you're living in sin, if you have a sin in your life, God's going to punish you for that. God will rebuke you and chasten you and chastise you and punish you for doing those sins. So if someone loves you, they don't want you to get punished by God. Like, I, If there's some great sin in my wife's life, I don't want my wife getting punished by God because I love her. I don't want bad things to happen unto her. So if she's doing something that's just real sinful, you know, hopefully I'm, I, I can do a good job of it. But, but of showing her, hey, look, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Because, because the Bible says you're supposed to be doing this. And, you know, that's an example of just me and my wife. But it's, that should be the way with anybody. If you care about someone, if you love them, you don't want them to have to go through the disciplining and the chastisement of the Lord. You want them to be able to, 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 to be in, in good standing with God and they can avoid that discipline, they can avoid that punishment and you're showing them a way that, and ultimately it's going to help them anyways. Besides the chastisement, besides the disciplining, when we're obeying God's word, if we're sinning, it's already going to have its own inherent negative consequences regardless of the disciplining of God. So, Living according to God's word is only going to help your, your life anyway. So when you're not doing what's right, when you're doing things that are wrong, and someone approaches you, hey, look, this is, this is going to actually help you out a lot more if you, do, if, if you stop doing that or if you do this. Um, this, is, this is actually, whether you, whether you believe it or not, whether you um, feel that way, especially at the time or not, it's, it's an act of love to, to tell people that they're doing something that's wrong. God told... Um, Cain, hey, look, I, you know, I didn't accept your sacrifice. And he's not going to. He's not going to look at his heart and say, oh, well, because he meant well, I'm just going to accept it. He says, no, I'm, this is the way it is. These are my rules. This is, this is what I want. But look, Cain, you can do what's right too. You have that option. And, and you know what? If you just do what's right, you'll be accepted too. You bring the right sacrifice everything's good and, and we're fine. And that's the way that God deals with it. It's, it's the same way with us. If we're going to do what's right, if we're going to listen to God's word, everything's great. But if we choose not to, 
um, you know, then, then everything won't be great. And everything didn't end up great for Cain. Look at where it led him. He had a very foolish response. He could have just repented. He could have just gotten right with God. Everything would have been fine. Instead, he got angry. He got bitter. He got, he got jealous of, of his brother because his brother is doing things, right? He's looking at his brother like, oh, Mr. You know, probably like Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, right? Oh, yeah, you're, the, you know, you're God's favorite and, and started to have this type of a mentality and this type of an attitude against his brother. Instead of humbling his own heart and getting himself right with God, he's lashing out at, at his brother, at the person who's doing right, instead of fixing his own problems. People often will do that as well. They don't want to deal with their own issues and their own problems, so they'll go out and attack someone else. When the problem really lies with themselves. And Cain, he gets angry and he ends up killing his own brother. I mean, think about that. He ends up killing his own flesh and blood, his own brother. Out of his own stinking bitterness. Unfortunately, Cain took the wrong path when he was confronted with his own sin, as we already read in verses 6 and 7. Look at verse number 8. It says, And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. We're going to see here where he kills him. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now look at Cain's attitude there. Has his attitude changed at all? I mean, he just killed his brother, and this is how he answers to God. He's basically smarting off to God. He said, I don't know where he is. What, am, am I his babysitter? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I supposed to be paying attention and watching what he's always up to? Do you see the type of attitude that he has towards God now already? And it all started with him just bringing the wrong sacrifice. It starts with him getting offended getting his feelings hurt or whatever because God didn't accept the sacrifice that he brought unto him because he didn't do what God asked. And people today, too many people today are, are spinning their wheels trying to serve God, doing all kinds of things that God never told us to do. And if you try to show them, if you try to tell them, hey, look, the Bible doesn't say we're supposed to be doing that stuff. We're supposed to be going and you know, preaching the gospel of every creature or doing, you know, doing these other things. A lot of times they'll just get offended and they'll get angry and they'll get bitter and then they don't want to talk to you anymore and it, you know, and it causes some big problem with them instead of just saying, you know what, you're right. This is what the Bible says. I should be doing what God wants instead of doing all these other things that he never said to do. And, and Cain gets this, this really bad, disrespectful attitude and just these short responses to God. And we end up seeing later in Scripture that Cain was actually a reprobate. Not every, now Cain was a murderer, right? He murdered his own brother. Not every, every person who kills someone else, not every murderer is a reprobate, but Cain was a reprobate. And that being a murderer is an attribute of a reprobate. Reprobate. In, in Romans chapter 1, you turn there if you would, we're going to look at a few verses in the New Testament. Romans chapter 1. Um, and people get this confused sometimes when we talk about the reprobate doctrine. They say, oh, no, because, and we're going to look at verse number 28. They'll say, you see, there's all these different things then. So if you're, uh, if you're um, disobedient to your parents, you know, they'll, they'll say, then you're a reprobate. But no, that's not what we believe at all. First, a person becomes reprobate by rejecting God, by worshiping and serving the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's what Romans 1 says, and it gives you the reasons why they're given up on. But then once that person is given up on, once they become rejected, once they become a reprobate, now they're going to have all of these different attributes. This is descriptive, starting in verse number 28 of Romans 1, of what a reprobate is like. These are their characteristics. Verse 28 says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Semicolon. And then it, it continues on here with all of those things which are not convenient. Verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, 
despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So these people who are reprobates, they are full of all, of the, they're filled with all unrighteousness. They're filled with all of these different sins. These are all characteristics of the reprobate. It doesn't mean if you do one of these things, now all of a sudden you're a reprobate. That's not what I believe at all. It's once you've become rejected, now all of a sudden you're going to be full of all of this type of wickedness and all of this sin and adultery and fornication and murder and, and all the things that lays out here. And it says not only that, not only do they do those things and not only do they know that they're worthy of death, but they take pleasure in those that do them. So the reprobate, they, they enjoy it. This is where they get their joy in, in other people doing the same thing and trying to get, to get other people to sin. And trying to get other people into their wickedness. That brings them pleasure. That brings them joy. These are the characteristics of a reprobate. And we see Cain was a murderer. And that is one of the characteristics here. But the reason why, the reason why we could know that Cain was a reprobate is because of these other references. Turn to Jude, if you would. And then we're going to go to 1 John chapter 3. Jude, and then 1 John chapter 3, we're going to see two references to Cain that give us very clear indication that he was a reprobate, that he was rejected. The book of Jude is a, is a chapter of the Bible, or is a book of the Bible. It's right before the book of Revelation. Just go all the way to Revelation, then flip back, Revelation chapter 1, and you'll have Jude right before that. But Jude is a book that talks about false teachers, false prophets, about, about these reprobates, okay? Verse number 10, it says, but these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts. In those things they corrupt themselves. It's talking about these reprobates, that they're, they're like animals. They're stupid animals, brute beasts. Verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So they're saying they, they're going the exact same way that Cain went. This is our first indication that Cain was a reprobate as well, because if they're going in the way that Cain went, and they're natural, and they're brute beasts, and you get, you know, read the whole, the whole book in context, you'll see what I'm talking about. And it says, um, For they've gone the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. So it brings up a couple other examples of reprobates as well, of Balaam and of uh, Cory. But um, that's the first one. But then flip back to 1 John chapter 3, just a couple pages backwards from Jude. 1 John chapter 3, we're going to see even a much more um, direct verse that's, that's basically calling Cain a reprobate. Verse number 11 of 1 John 3 says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain who was of that wicked one and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. So there, first of all, we get the, we get the motive. The only reason why Cain slew, killed his brother is because his own works were evil and his brothers were righteous. And when people are doing wickedness, they don't like oftentimes being around people who are living right. And that's why they'll attack them and they'll verbally assault them and everything else because they don't want their own wickedness exposed. And when someone's doing well and someone's doing right and someone's living for God, that makes them look that much worse when they're in their wickedness. And they don't like looking. No, people, nobody likes looking bad. But it says in verse 12 there, it says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. And I kind of covered this a little bit last week because this is the verse that people will use with the whole serpent seed thing. But... Um, what that means, he was of that wicked one. He was spiritually of that wicked one. He was just like we are born again, we become child of God, children of God. Well, when we're born again and we're saved, we become a child of God, we're always his child. We're his child forever. God is always our father. We're always his children. We can never lose our salvation. We're saved forever. We have eternal life. We have a new creature. That new creature doesn't die. That new creature can't even sin. That new creature is perfect. But the, in that same manner that we're born again spiritually unto God and become his children, in the same way people can be born again unto death, basically unto, unto Satan and become a child of the devil. 
where, I mean, once you're born, you're born, right? When you're spiritually, when you're physically born, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to have any other physical parents in my life. I have my mother and my father, and that's it. There's no way I could have anyone else that's ever going to physically be my other. Uh, it, it's impossible. Spiritually, it's the same way. When you're spiritually born again, you're either going to be born of the Father or born of the devil. And that's who you are then for, for the rest of eternity. And that's why our life here is so important. And the things that we do and our communication with people and the way that we live and preaching the gospel is because of that fact. But here we see clearly again, Cain was of that wicked one. He was of the devil. And um, so let's flip back to Genesis chapter number 4. And we'll keep reading here. Verse number... So verse number 9, God's asking Cain, you know, where is he? Obviously God knows. He doesn't need to ask him, but he's asking him for a reason. And Cain fails again because he just gives a smart answer. And um, verse number 10, God's speaking to Cain. He says, and he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And this is really interesting. He says that this, this, um, this concept of, of the blood you know, crying out unto God from the ground is found in many other places in Scripture. I'm not going to turn to any of them tonight, um, but if you've read the Bible before, you know what I'm talking about. And you could, especially in the Old Testament, um, when innocent blood is shed, God is the revenger of that innocent blood. You know, we may not know, and there, and there was, a, there was a, you know, all the different sacrifices in the Mosaic Law. And one of the things that they would do is if they would come across someone, like if they were just out in the wilderness, they'd find a body, right? And they have no idea who did it. So they can't hold that person responsible. They would have a sacrifice that they would make and say, God, you know, clean us from this shed blood. We don't know who did this. And they would offer up a special sacrifice just because this person died and their blood was shed. And they're like, we don't know what happened. We have no idea, God. We can't figure this out. Please don't hold us liable for this death because we don't know anything about it. We don't know how it happened, Lord. So we can't hold this person responsible that commit this crime. And, um, and they would you know, do a sacrifice for that. But God is the one that is always the revenger of the innocent blood. He's the, he's the one that will stand up for the poor and for the needy. And, and you know, his voice, he gets angry when people go against the, you know, the weaker and, um, and the fatherless and the widows. But um, God is going to recompense for the innocent blood that's shed. And think about that now in our country for all the innocent blood that is being shed on a daily basis. On all the, the helpless ones with the abortions, with the unborn, and, and the, uh, you know, the killing inside of the womb that's being done. That's innocent blood literally being shed in this country. And that blood, just as sure as Abel's blood was crying out from the ground, you, I guarantee you the blood of those little children is crying out unto God in heaven. And he hears that blood on a daily basis. And you think he's not going to recompense for that wickedness that's being done every single day in this country? Because it is. It's going to come. God's judgment will come for that wickedness. And we can't be forgetful of these things. God will revenge for, those, for that blood that's happening. And we need to do everything in our power to make that stop. Stop the murder and the killing of these innocent children. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 11, it says, Now he's going to curse Cain. Now notice, this is, this is before God has instituted the death penalty. The judgment that God brings down on Cain for killing someone is not death. He changes that after the flood. We'll get into that when we get to that chapter but, um, a little bit. But um, we see here that right now God gives him a different curse. Let's see what it is. Verse number 11, it says, And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. So he's saying, okay, you shed your brother's blood and it, and it spilled out on the ground and the ground soaked up your brother's blood. He's saying, now 
when you try to till the ground, because remember, Cain was a farmer, right? That's what he did. The earth is not going to yield or strength unto you. So he's going to be he's going to be trying to grow crops, and they're going to be failing, and he's going to have a real, real difficult time even trying to survive because of what he did. This is the curse that God laid upon Cain. And now look at Cain again, his reaction, verse number 13. Does he say, God, forgive me. I'm sorry, God. I won't, you know, I, I did wrong. I won't do it again. Does this attitude he has? No. Look what he says. He says, verse 13, And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Oh, God, woe is me. God, please don't do so wickedly to me. Please don't make me a fugitive and a vagabond. God, it's too much, as he already took his brother's life. Now, don't forget this, too. In these days, people were living to be some 900 years old. Oh, I'm sorry, Cain. You killed your brother and, and ended his life short by probably hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years? And you expect your life now just to be roses? And have no, no recompense for what you've done? And now you're just going to complain to God about how terrible it is and, and how you can't even bear that punishment? But this is the way the reprobate thinks, apparently. Verse number 14 says, Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on, it, on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. Um, so Cain is worried. He's afraid that now because he killed Abel, and because now he's, he's going to be driven from the presence of God, and he's going to be a vagabond, he's thinking that, look, anyone that comes and finds me, they're going to kill me. They're going to want me dead because I killed Abel. And um, so he was, he was worried about this, and God said, okay, he said, I'm going to place a mark on you. And he says, if anybody, if anybody goes to kill you, it's going to, they're going to be avenged seven times as much. So whatever they do to you, it's going to be seven times as bad for them. And um, so God sets a mark upon Cain. Now, um, I brought up last week the wickedness of Satan. You remember in the Garden of Eden and, and him saying that, um, the, that, that Adam and Eve, they'd be like gods. And that was his pitch to him. And I brought up how wicked that is and how satanic that is to want to be like gods. And that's exactly what the Mormon church teaches. That, hey, one day you'll be like gods and you'll have your own planet to reign over and you will be a god of your own planet. And how wicked and sinful that is. Well, that same religion that teaches that satanic doctrine also teaches, or at least taught, that this mark, this mark that God put upon Cain was that he made him black. And if you didn't know this, it's because they're trying to hide it and cover it for the past 20 or 30 years. But this is what the Mormon church teach, taught and believed. And I don't even know what they believe now about it. But the Mormon church is a racist church because they believe and they have believed historically since their foundation that blacks are inferior, that they're a lesser race, that they're cursed of God, and that they're not like the white man. And that this is, this is exactly what they believe, that it came from this, from this mark upon Cain. And they weren't even allowed to, to have any positions in the church for a super long period of time until like the civil rights movement. And, and for some reason or another, someone sued them and all of a sudden their prophet got this new revelation that, oh, okay, no, you know what, actually blacks are allowed in church as they're undergoing a lawsuit and as they're being um, publicly you know, ridiculed and attacked for their stance on, on black people during that time. And all of a sudden, how convenient it is to have this new revelation. Oh, you know what? Actually, it is okay. But that, this, look up the history of the Mormon church, my friends, and don't be deceived. Don't be deceived by these people who want to come and tell you how much they, they're like you. And want to say, oh, yeah, I'm Christian too. And how great they are and how nice they are and how wonderful they are with their satanic religion that teaches you you can be a god and that there's all these different universes and all these different gods and, and one day you'll have your, your virgin wives and make spirit babies and everything else. It's bizarre. It's weird. It's of the devil. And don't fall for it. And they're racist. 
But think about how stupid that is. Because it's not just the Mormons. Other people have said similar things. That, oh yeah, the black man is cursed. And that this mark for, uh, upon Cain is, is a similar thing. And it doesn't even make any sense. What was the purpose for God putting the mark on Cain? The whole purpose was that, someone, that people would see that mark and not kill him, right? But their contention is that, oh, he made him black, which is where we get the whole black race from. So if our whole black race spawned from Cain, first of all, which, which is stupidity, then that would mean that the whole purpose of the mark would be defeated because, like I said, people were living, you know, 900 years old at this time. Cain had children. If this is where the black race came from, then, okay, what about his children that grew up? And over the course of 100 years, I mean, are you really going to tell the difference between Cain and, and maybe one of his sons? They'd all be black, right? I mean, if it was passed down and this is where the whole race started from, then what about people who came to, to, to kill Cain? Well, now they wouldn't be able to kill any of his children because they'd all be black. It, it, it doesn't make any sense. God puts some kind of a mark on it. It doesn't matter what exactly the mark was. It's not the spawning of an entire race. It was some mark that he had individually given to one person that's not genetically passed down. There's nothing from the Bible to prove anything like that. It was just a mark that people could identify and say, okay, God has, has said that you know, if, you, if you do any harm to Cain, he's going to bring sevenfold onto you. And that was it. It was, for, it was for his protection in that sense. Because God had already cast his judgment upon him and he was all, the ground was already cursed for his sake and he was already serving his sentence for what he had done that was wrong according to God's justice system and no one else was going to was, should have uh, messed with that. And so God just let him know with a mark. But let's keep reading here. Verse number 16. And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. And you'll find that a lot in the Bible. Actually, when you look at cities um, just all throughout the Old Testament, um, they're like, they're all named after people. They're all named after a, a progenitor, after one of their earlier fathers. Typically, um, oftentimes it was when they would take over another country, another nation, they'd change the name to their name or, you know, to their son's name. Or if they just founded a new city or a new dwelling place, then they would call that place after that person's name. And it's actually really good for, for learning a lot of, deep studying in the Bible on, on who people were and where they were. Um, anyway, I'm not going to get into all that tonight. That's, that's something for your own studying. But just, just, just understand that, that most, of the, most, if not all, of the cities are named after people. And when you're reading about places um, in the Bible, they're usually named after somebody. So we see that here. This, there was a city called Enoch that was named after his son Enoch. Verse number 18, And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begat Mehujael, and Mehujael begat Methusael, and Methusael begat Lamech. So now we come to Lamech, a few generations deep. Verse 19, And Lamech took unto him two wives. It's the first recorded person that has multiple wives. Remember in Genesis, in, in chapter 2, it says, For this cause man shall leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. It's singular, it's... it's one man leaving his father and mother and cleaving unto his wife. Um, even though people had m polygamous relationships, it's never condoned in the Bible. It's um, God commands to have uh, you know, a man and a woman. But um, here we see Lamech. He's, he's of, uh, of the seed of Cain. So he's, he's one of Cain's descendants. And remember, Cain was a reprobate, but he's, he's, he's being fruitful, he's multiplying, and his descendants are having children. So these are all people, they're not growing up in a godly home, right? They're, they're, none of these people are growing up that way, from what we can tell. I mean, it's, it's unless, unless he had some of his immediate descendants that turned to God, um, we have no indication of that. But more than likely, they're not. This is, this is what's going to become the heathen, right? And um, it says, And Lamech took on him two wives. Gives us their names, verse 20, and Ada bare Jabal, and he was the father of such as dwell in tents and of such as have cattle. And this is kind of interesting too, because we're going to see now there's different people who they're starting to be this type of person and that type of person. They're starting to have more of like specialties 
in what they did with their lives. And they're saying, oh yeah, this was kind of the founder and starter of, you know, we're the, it says, uh, you know, J-Ball, he was the father of such as dwell in tents and, and such as have cattle. So he was like a cattle rancher. And, um, and he dwelt in tents, so he was probably moving around where, wherever his, his cattle would graze. He'd pitch his tent, and, and that's where he lived for a while, and somewhat nomadic, and that's, he was the, the father of those types of people. And it was just a, kind of an occupation that he started doing. Verse 21 says, And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all such as handle the harp and organ. He was a musician. Right? So they had these musical instruments, and, and he became a musician. Verse number 22, And Zillah, she also bare Tubal Cain, an instructor of every artificer, in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. And um, what's interesting here is the specialized work, but notice how this also flies in the face of what the godless human history is going to tell you. Who remembers um, being taught about the Stone Age? And then there was the Bronze Age. And then there was the Iron Age, right? And that, that this is kind of the, the development of mankind from Neanderthal. They built these, you know, stone tools and, and all of this really primitive stuff. And then they, would, they, they got more advanced and, um, you know, became a Homo erectus and, um, you know, all these other names that they have, the stupidity for their evolutionary theory of man going from an ape into, into a human being which is retarded and just the epitome of stupidity. But um, what we read here from God's word, from the truth, is completely different. And they would tell you, you know, oh, first there was a stone age and people were always using just these stone tools and then they learned about bronze and started making everything in bronze and then they learned about iron and then everything was being made in iron and, you know, and their tools and their weapons and everything. And, um, but what we see in verse 22 is that Tubal Cain was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. So he's, I mean, he's using multiple different types of metals, and this is way back near the very creation of the earth of, of man. I mean, this is what, like four or five generations deep where we get to this point? Not very, not very far, and they're already, you know, he's already able to build things. They're already making musical instruments. Um, you know, a harp and an organ. I mean, think about an organ. They actually, you have to have, the, for the pipes, I mean, you, you have to be able to, to, to have pretty good understanding and knowledge to be able to make these types of things. People weren't stupid ever. I mean, God had given man knowledge, and people like to think that, oh, we're so smart these days, and, you know, people in history have always just been real dumb, and they didn't know this, and they didn't know that, and, they, you know, mankind likes to lift themselves up in so much pride, and, oh, we know so much more than all of those poor people throughout history that have just been limited understanding. When you read the Bible, there's actually some pretty amazing things that they've been able, people have been able to do for a really long time. And that's why we even see these wonders that are out still today and they can't figure out how are the Great Pyramids built and all these other things. Because mankind wasn't always stupid. They have this wrong, this, this incorrect world view that somehow man, you know, we evolved from apes. So all of us, you know, we're getting more and more intelligent that they, there's no way they could have been smart enough to be able to do these things back then. But that's just completely false and incorrect. But uh, let's keep reading here. Verse number 23. It says, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So now we see Lamech killed somebody. And we don't know the details of this, but apparently he feels that he was more justified in his killing than Cain was. Because he's saying, okay, look, I killed a young man to my wounding and to my hurt, you know, to my... To my detriment, I killed somebody. It's my fault. And if what I did, if my murder, or I mean, excuse me, if Cain's murder is going to be avenged seven times, he's like, I was so much more justified in this. If anyone comes after me, I should be avenged 70, 77 times as much as, you know, instead of just seven times. If someone comes after me, they should be cursed 77 times as much as someone who would go after Cain. Um, and we see here that it's, you know, it's not, um, 
he wasn't so concerned about his own punishment. He was concerned about what other people were going to do to him. It's a similar attitude where he's, you know, he's not really quite owning up to what he did. But it's, it's, a, it's a pattern that's going to start happening. And, and this is one of the reasons I believe that God does institute the death penalty. Because they look at it as saying, oh, well, you know, the, the punishment might not have been severe enough to be a deterrent for other people. Lamech obviously knew about Cain, even though it was like his great, great, great grandfather or whatever. Um, he was probably still alive anyways, but... Um, We see here that he was able to ju he was somehow justifying himself and just just concerned about um, what would happen to someone else if they tried to revenge the blood. And ultimately, then you know, up until the flood, we're going to get there within the next chapter or two. The whole world then just becomes wicked and violent, and is just filled with wickedness to where God has to destroy the whole world with the flood. But let's keep reading here. We're almost done. There's actually one major point that we're going to spend a, l a little bit of time on right at the end of this chapter. So let's keep reading. Verse number 25 says, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son, and called his name Seth. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. And now I'll focus in as we close up this chapter on that last phrase. So at this time now, so Adam and Eve, they had... Cain and Abel, right? Cain killed Abel. And then later on, they end up having another son, Seth. And Eve's happy about this. She's saying, you know, you know thank God. He's, he's given us another son now because Abel's dead. And, he, and he, he's, now he's given us Seth. So they have another son, and they're happy about that. And then Seth bears a son called Enos. And then it says, began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, People have always been saved throughout history the same exact way. It's by grace through faith. Romans 4 explains as well as many, many, many other chapters in the Bible that no one has ever been saved by their works. We, see the, we saw the picture of Adam and Eve where the, the coats of skin were given unto Adam and Eve as that picture of, of the shed blood of the Savior to come and to cleanse them from their sins. And with calling upon the name of the Lord, this is exactly why we, and I want to explain this, you know, people ask sometimes, why do you go out and pray with people or you get criticized? And people say, oh, you do one, two, three, repeat after me. And no, we don't. First of all, we don't do that. We don't just say, okay, look, you're a sinner. Okay, look, and just, just breeze through the gospel and just get them to pray a prayer and just proclaim them saved. That's not what we do at all. Anyone who's been here, who's been out soul winning with us, knows that's not what we do. And we don't believe in doing that. We're very, very thorough in our presentation of the gospel. And we really want to make sure people understand that they know what they're hearing. They understand the gospel. They understand the free gift before anything. But when we're done talking with someone, obviously the Bible says that you know in order to be saved, we need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we need to do for salvation. But this concept of calling upon the name of the Lord is found all throughout Scripture and is extremely biblical. And we've had conversations recently about this. So I want to kind of take a little bit of time and go much more in depth about calling upon the name of the Lord. Because there's the reasons for this is because of what we find in Scripture. That's why we pray with people. So um, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2. Because obviously we see, hey, people are starting to call on the name of the Lord here. It's, it's, it's not in there by accident. It's not in the Bible by accident. People realize they need a Savior, and this is where they start getting saved when they call upon the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at the New Testament first, and then we'll look at some Old Testament examples of people calling on the name of the Lord. Acts chapter 2, verse 20 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Then flip over to chapter 22. So we see here, um, this was the Apostle Peter. He's quoting from Joel in the Old Testament, and, and we'll get to that. That's one of the last references I have. But it basically says the same exact thing as this. We, we don't really have to turn there, but um, we will later anyways. But basically, it's talking about um, before the, the day of the Lord comes. It says, anyone, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
Flip to Acts 22, look at verse 16. We're going to see how Paul got saved. The Apostle Paul, when he was Saul, and Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, and there's this great light that shined, and it blinded him, and he was led by the hand, and, and he talks with Ananias. It says in verse number 16 of 22, chapter 22, this Ananias talking to the Apostle Paul. He says, And now, why tarriest thou? Why are you waiting? He says, Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. This is how he was getting saved, by calling on the name of the Lord, asking God to save you. See, God has that free gift of salvation that's open to everybody, but it's up to you to receive it. And we need to receive that, yes, by putting our faith in Christ, but when we put our faith in Christ, we call out unto God and ask Him for that gift or ask Him to save us. Just as the, the thief on the cross said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. It could be as simple as, as, as that. It doesn't have to be any specific words. You don't have to go through this long oration and prayer of, of other, or else you're not saved, but you need to call upon the name of the Lord. Um, Romans 10. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10 explains this as well. You can't call upon the name of the Lord without belief, which is why the two go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. You can't, you can't call upon the name of the Lord for salvation unless you believe. Romans 10 verse 12 says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon Him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? So, this is starting to explain now. That's why it's not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom, as Matthew 7 says. Because you have to call on God in whom you've believed. Verse 14, How then shall they call on me in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This explains soul winning to a T. This is exactly why we do things the way we do them. Because if we start backwards, it's talking about how beautiful are the feet, your feet, Right? Not their feet coming into the church, the feet of them that bring, that preach the gospel of peace. Because we go out, we bring the gospel to them. We bring the gospel out to the people. How beautiful are the feet that preach the gospel of peace. So this is talking about people preaching the gospel. Right? How should we be preaching the gospel? Well, first we see that we need to be going out because it's our feet that's going to take us out there. And it says, and how shall they preach except they be sent? That's why we send people out. The local church sends out the people to go and do the soul winning. You're getting sent from here. That's why you're getting sent in order to preach. And then we're, as we're going backwards here because it says, how shall they hear? The person at the door needs to hear. With, they need a preacher. Somebody needs to preach the gospel unto a person in order for them to get saved. It's the only thing that makes sense. They need to be preached to. Not just handed a Bible. Not just handed a track. That's not preaching. Handing someone a piece of paper. How shall they hear? Except you preach. And you have to be sent to preach. And then he says, um, the next step after that is, how shall they believe in whom they have not heard? So in order to believe, because they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved, they need to hear. Which is why we're sent to preach the gospel. And then it says, you know, going back to the beginning, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So we go out. This is the order we do it. We, we, we're sent out. We go out. We preach the gospel so that people can hear it. And in hearing, they might believe. And in believing, they call upon the name of the Lord. It's very simple here in Romans chapter 10. It gives us that whole outline, which is exactly what we do. This is the, the template that we're following when we go out soul winning. And people like to criticize you for that. It's like, oh, you just believe in this sinner's prayer stuff, and that's not what gets you saved. And people have all these stupid reasons. And you know what they're doing? They're sitting on their rear ends in front of a computer just typing about how wrong you are for going out soul winning and getting people to, to call upon the name of the Lord like the Bible says. And they're doing nothing. But that's always the way it is. People want to criticize you 
for doing something according to the way the Bible says, like it says in Romans chapter 10, and they don't do anything themselves. Don't listen to those naysayers. The Bible tells us very specifically here, and, and we're going to see back. Flip back, if you would, to Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 12, because this was the New Testament. I wanted to show you the New Testament scripture, because the New Testament obviously is very important for preaching the gospel. We saw Paul, the Apostle Paul getting saved, calling upon the name of the Lord as they were washing his sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. We saw in Acts 2, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We saw in Romans chapter 10, the same exact thing. And then we see in Genesis chapter 12, we're going to see Abram. Abraham. When he was still Abram. And the Lord appeared unto Abram. Verse number 7. Genesis 12, 7. And the Lord appeared unto Abram. And said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. We see Isaac in Genesis 26. Flip over to Genesis 26. So Abraham we see calling upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 26 verse 24. We're going to see Isaac do the same thing. Genesis 26, 24, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. Uh, first Chron Turn, if you would, to Psalm 116. I'll read from you from 1 Chronicles 16. Psalm 116. This is really important. I want you all to see this. Psalm 116. This is, th that's gonna be, this is gonna be the key passage for, for showing people calling on the name of the Lord for salvation in the Old Testament. I'll read from you about David in 1 Chronicles 16 verse 7 says, Then on that day David delivered the first this psalm to thank the Lord into the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Give thanks unto the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. That was in 1 Chronicles, which is also um, Psalm 102. I forget which psalm is the, the exact um, same as that. But then Psalm 116, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. Psalm 116, verse number 1 says, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. How God, how's God going to hear your voice when you're praying to him? Right? Your supplications, you're bringing things unto God. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. God listens, God hears. We call upon him. Let's keep reading though because that's not, that's not the, the salvation part. That's talking about calling on him as long as I live. Verse number three, the sorrows of death compassed me and the pains of hell got hold upon me I found trouble and sorrow then called I upon the name of the Lord O Lord I beseech thee deliver my soul he's saying save my soul deliver my soul dear God because the pains of hell got hold on me the sorrows of death compassed me and if you're a sinner hey the pains of hold are getting a hold of you too if you haven't received Christ you're a sinner hellbound. You need to be saved. You need to be, your soul needs to be delivered. Verse number five. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low and he helped me. Return unto thy rest, O my soul. For the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Look at verse number 10. I believed, therefore have I spoken. This is the same exact order that you get from Romans chapter 10. You pre you know, people preach, they hear, they believe, and then they call on the name of the Lord. He says here, I have believed, therefore I have spoken. And I remember my, my, my very own salvation. I was all alone. No one led me in a prayer However, I did pray to God to save me. I put my faith in Christ. I believed on Christ, and I called on God to save me. And the only reason I called out unto God is because I believed. Why would I call on someone in whom I don't believe or, or on something 
for something I didn't believe in. Of course, I believed. I put my faith in Christ, and then I, and then I called on him. I believed, therefore have I spoken. I was greatly afflicted. Verse number 11, I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? Look at verse number 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Taking the cup of salvation is calling on the name of the Lord. And people like to criticize us for, for leading people in what's known as a sinner's prayer and calling on God to save them. When how many passages did we go to now to show you how scriptural and how biblical it is for people to call upon the name of the Lord? People started calling on the name of the Lord all the way back in Genesis chapter 4. We see that. With, right after Seth's son is born, people started calling on God. And I'll read for you from, I have it in my notes, Joel chapter 2 is where that Acts chapter 2 quote came from. Joel 2.31 says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. These are not all the references to people calling on the name of the Lord in the Bible, but these are the most important ones, I believe. Um, and I just wanted to show you that that is found all throughout the Bible. And, and you know, don't let anyone dissuade you from doing the, the sinner's prayer and, um, and, and leading people or helping people to call on the name of the Lord. People say, oh, I don't see that in the Bible. No one ever did that in the New Testament. Paul explained it in Romans 10 pretty clearly. We saw David in, in, in the book of Psalms in, in that um, <clears throat> Psalm one, uh, 116 says very clearly, taking the cup of salvation and calling on the name of the Lord. And I have believed, therefore have I spoken. Um, this is why we do that. So if you're wondering why we do that, that's exactly why we do that, is, is because of all these references to calling upon the name of the Lord. Obviously, I believe every line of the Bible. I believe that what the Bible says about um, whosoever believeth shall be saved. I believe that wholeheartedly. But I also believe that um, we pray because we believed. And, and that's why we call upon the name of the Lord in, that, in faith. And... Um, there is nothing unbiblical or unscriptural about that practice. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to, to read your word tonight. God, I pray that you would please just um, help us to be strong in the faith, help us to, to learn all these great truths as we go through the Bible, dear God, and um, help us to be solid and founded and grounded in the truth and be able to have an answer for, for all of those that would question our faith, dear Lord. And help us just to learn more about you and about your words and also about what your will is for us in our life. God, help us to be boldened, emboldened to, uh, to preach the word, to go out and preach the gospel, dear Lord. And not just to wait for people to, to come to us, but to actually go out and do the work that you've laid out for us to do. And also to do so in a, in a scriptural manner in the way that you would have us to do it, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.